Good morning. What a pleasure it is to be here today. I'm not being welcomed, incidentally. Graham and I agreed that I'm too well known here. <laughs> so it is a pleasure, a real pleasure to be back with you today. And uh, I do pray that God will bless us as we share together in our worship. And if you're watching online, then the welcome is to you also. May God bless you. Let's now continue our worship as we sing the first hymn, the psalm, O God of Bethel, by whose hand thy people still are fed. Now we come before God in our prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, who has blessed us more than we can think and much more than we deserve, we are glad to be gathered for worship together today as the people of God in concert with the worldwide church across many nations and many cultures, meeting in great cathedrals, local churches of all denominations, mission halls, prison and hospital chapels, house churches, meeting as the family of faith, united in our desire to follow Jesus. Forgive us for anything that has come between the fellowship you want us to have as citizens of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. 
for selfishness that inclines us to want our own way, intolerance which makes us blinkered to see only our own point of view, and unbecoming self-assertiveness that we sometimes impose on others. So cleanse and purify us that we may truly be one in Christ. We seek a real blessing today in our worship as we center our thoughts, our prayers, and our actions on your word of life with the power to transform us as we open up ourselves to the challenge of your all-seeing and all-knowing presence through the Holy Spirit. If we have brought burdens we are carrying that seems heavier each day, give us the strength to go on. If we are here with a sadness, lift our spirit. If we are living with guilt, remove it with your forgiving grace. And if we are here to celebrate a life event or a rite of passage, if we have cause to give grateful thanks for some good news, magnify our joy. However we have come, however we have come through these doors today or tuned into the service online, bless us with your presence that by the end of this service we'll be able to say thank you to God for it was good for us to have been here. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, young folks. It's good to see you here today. And if, if it's okay with you, I'll stay in the pulpit as I've done before, but I can see you better, I think, in that way. And are there young folks at all in the congregation further back? You're all young. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. The first question to the young folks, and indeed to everyone. Have you ever been to an art gallery? Have you ever been to an art gallery? Hand up if you've ever been. In, yeah, and the grown-ups can do that. Too. Yeah, good. That's wonderful. Have you ever been to the Glasgow Art Gallery. Yeah. Now, that is a wonderful place, and I, I am familiar with the Art Gallery, Glasgow Art Gallery over at Kelvin Grove uh, since I was very, very young. Well, relatively young. Because from about, I think, the age of, I would be about 10, the teachers at the school, the primary school, said to my parents, I think that John, that's my name by the way, <laughs> that John should go to art classes. So I was enrolled to art classes, painting classes, in the art galleries, no less. Yeah. Now that was a great experience. I went there on Saturday mornings. And as well as painting, we were taken round the different rooms in the art gallery and the purpose was to view the great works of art. Because you, yeah, you can learn from other people. It's very, very important. And if there are artists today, which there will be given this nice big congregation, they learned from other people as well. Now. I like the Glasgow Art Galleries and sometimes we pop in to see how things have changed and things have changed quite a lot. The, those 
grown-ups of my generation will remember those days and they're going to smile I promise you they will smile when I tell them tell you that in those days in the main part of the art gallery on the ground floor it was filled with showcases glass cases filled with ships that were built on the Clyde give me a nod if you remember there we are and a wave at the back wonderful the whole of the downstairs glass cases with ships that were built on the Clyde now that's all changed however the two most famous and most valuable paintings that are in the Glasgow art galleries these days the two of them one is entitled Christ of St John of the cross by a very very famous artist Salvador Dali it's an amazing painting and it was brought to the city by a man called Tim Honeyman who was involved I think in the city council now Salvador Dali painted that in 1951 and we're so privileged to have it in Glasgow if you haven't seen it then you must see it the other one sounds less uh, kind of special but it's very special what's it called it's called Alexander Reed how's that for the title of a painting that is one of the greatest paintings that we have in the city Alexander Reed now why is it important although it has a very ordinary name well it was painted by an even more famous artist I think than Salvador Dali it was painted by Van Gogh Van Gogh but that's going a way way back way way back and both these pictures are visited or paintings are visited by more than one million visitors to the art gallery every year isn't that wonderful now why is Alexander Reed's painting there and why is it quite important well Alexander Reed was a Glasgow art dealer he was born in Glasgow and he was brought up in Finison I don't know if there's anyone from Finison here are we sure if, if you're from Finison no this is Piers Den sorry <laughs> he's brought up in Finison and he was an art dealer and he gets so friendly with Van Gogh he used to buy and sell paintings all over the place he gets so friendly with Van, with um, Van Gogh that he actually stayed with him for a while in France he stayed with him in his house and they became very very close friends although they kind of fell out late, later on now here's the interesting thing and you do a Google search and you'll be interested in this I think when you look at the picture of Alexander Reed right and then look at one of the self-portraits of Van Gogh they're almost identical they are and the reason is that they both look someone said that they look like twins they've got beards and they look like twins isn't that fine now when when somebody looks very like somebody else but they're not related to them here's a big word for you but you can forget it it's, it's called a doppelganger right you get into school get into school on Monday and say do you know what a doppelganger is and they won't know I'll give you another illustration yesterday I was out shopping as I do sometimes and a man stopped me and said Harry <laughs> Harry and I, <laughs> said you're Harry I said Harry they said you're a golfer I said I've never played golf in my life <laughs> we said oh we said 
I thought you were Harry. <laughs> but I haven't seen him for 20 years. <laughs> so I, in fact, am a doppelganger for some man called Harry. <laughs> I don't know who he is. Now, where is all this going? Well, the Bible passage that we're going to be reading later on um, when you're out at the, the Sunday Club, right? It's from a New Testament book called Hebrews. Now, Hebrews was just an old, old name for the Jewish people. An old, old name. But when I read chapter 11, which we're going to read later on, it takes me back to my days at the art gallery looking at all these portraits of famous people and some not for famous people. Because as we walk our way through Hebrews chapter 11, as it were, as we read it, it's as if we're, we're walking and looking at portraits. There are famous names from the Old Testament. Here are some of them. Abel, Noah. What did Noah do? He built the ark, that's right. He built the ark, that's right. Abraham, very famous man. Isaac, Jacob. Oh, and here's one that you will know very, very well. Joseph's picture, as it were, is there also. What did Joseph have that was very special? Come on, what did he have? Yeah, someone else? Yeah, he had this beautiful coat of many colors. So Joseph's there, and Moses is there too. Now, the writer says, you'll see it, the writer in that chapter 11 says, look, I could go on, I could go on and tell you more, but like sensible ministers, he doesn't want to bore the folks with going on and on the way I'm doing. So here's the question before you go out to your special activity. Why did these people qualify to be in this kind of gallery, these special people? Well, because of the trust that they put in God. And they got into this, what we might call a gallery of faith. When people trust in God and His promises, even though they can't see God because we can't see God, but when we trust in Him, even though we can't, that's called faith. Now, to remind us of that, on the coffee table at home, we've got this little placemat. I wonder if anyone's eyesight is good. Can you read it? Yeah. Faith. That's right. You see it over there? No, I thought not. <laughs> the folks at the back, well, serves you right for sitting at the back. <laughs> faith. And it says, faith, believe God for the impossible. Now, young folks, as you keep coming to the church, and I hope you will keep coming to it as you grow up, you'll learn more and more of what it means to have faith in God. I made a special decision when I was the age of some of you here, but you'll to have faith in God. But while you're out enjoying yourself in the Sunday club now, after the hymn, I'll try not to bore the grown-ups. Let's sing one of my favorite choruses and hymns. It's, this is the day that the Lord has made. And if there are any non-Presbyterians here who want to give a wee bit of emphasis here and there, to clap it or whatever, that's fine. But I know that we are. Okay, Derek, thank you.
We will remain seated as we sing our prayer for understanding, hymn number 712. Our reading this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verses 1 to 12. And this can be found in the Pew Bible at number 1209. By faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, uncertain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Amen. May God the reading of his word. And our next hymn is hymn number 549. How deep the Father's love for us.
We pray together. Gracious God, speak to us now through your word. And bless us and challenge us and give us your peace. Amen. This coming week marks a significant milestone in my life. For it was 50 years ago that I was ordained to the Holy Ministry of Word and Sacrament as Minister of the Church of Scotland by the Presbytery of Paisley and inducted into the charge of the Atherley Barhead. 50 years, a long time. That evening was, of course, an occasion not to be forgotten. Not just because as I waited nervously before the service, the fact that the Presbytery clerk polluted my newly acquired vestry with his pipe smoke, and the then moderator of Paisley Presbytery with his cigar smoke. How times have changed. I had been licensed by Glasgow Cathedral, by the Presbytery of, P of Glasgow the previous year. Now, when it came to the point of looking for a charge as my probationary year in Motherwell was uh, drawing to, to a close, it was normal for there to be a goodly number of ministers vying for different charges or seeking the call of God. It was not easy to get a charge in those days given the demand. Again, how times have changed. Often churches can find it difficult to get even one applicant. Times have changed. Viewing the coronation last week and watching the king taking his vows, being anointed and crowned, brought that day of my ordination back to me being ordained by the laying on of hands by the members of the presbytery. I took my vows before the presbytery and before the congregation. But more importantly, I took my vows before God, as did the king at his coronation. The induction social took place a day or two after the ordination, and it was the usual mix of singing by the choir, get yourself practicing, not that you need it, <laughs> anecdotes and terrible jokes told by local ministers being gifted with a set of robes in pure silk, being placed on my shoulders by the president of the Women's Guild, as was the custom in those days. Presentation of flowers to my wife Jane. And all completed in the hall with tea, with enough home baking to last four induction socials. That's just par for the course for any congregation. Now take note of all this as you seek for a new minister. That's what's ahead of you. Exciting, isn't it? For me, however, the highlight of the social was the special guest speaker, Professor William Barclay, with whom I had formed a special bond, I like to think, 
during my time at Trinity College when he was the New Testament lecturer. Willie Barclay, found, who found great acceptance with his lectures on television. I was listening to the audio tape of Professor Barclay's speech at uh, my induction. The tape was 50 years old, a cassette tape. It had not been well recorded and his gravelly voice did not come out too uh, clear. But it was a special time to have, to have uh, Professor Barclay commending me to the congregation. I suppose my ordination was the culmination of my simple childhood faith and a commitment as a child to give my life to God as I understood it at the time. Can I say, don't underestimate the faith of children and young people. They grasp more than we know in their own limited, simple way. As a child, I memorized many Bible verses, a practice which seems to have gone out of fashion these days in Christian circles. But one of the memorable verses that I learned much later in life, not as a child, but much later in life, was the first verse in Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. I'll read it again. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. I like Eugene Peterson's version in, from the Message Bible. And here it is. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. And here's his lovely bit here at the end. It's our handle on what we can't see. Isn't that lovely? Faith, it's our handle on what we can't see. As a child, I would have been pretty incapable of understanding uh, this verse, whether in the, the old 1611 authorized um, King James Version or whether Peterson's, which wasn't around then of course. But even now to understand what the writer is getting at requires in our limited human understanding, it requires some illumination from the Holy Spirit, let's be honest, if we really want to understand what that means. People out there, so to speak, who increasingly have no knowledge of the Bible and no interest in God, and you only need to look at the questions that are asked on the chase, and virtually nobody answers anything correctly related to the Bible. But even for all of us, even Christian people, we need some illumination from the Holy Spirit to understand this meaning, this word that's spoken about faith. The writer, of course, illustrates that first verse by listing great figures of faith in the old, from the Old Testament that I was talking to the young folks about. Faith. What, what do you hold on to in your life? What's the driving force? What's, what motivates you day by day? Well, let's go back to my first charge in Barhead. 
Once for the children's talk or the children's address as we would call it then, I tried to dispel the whole idea of bad luck and good luck. I said that for the Christian there is no such thing. Luck is not a concept that we accept. So luck does not exist for the Christian. I thought I had really got the point across. I was quite pleased with how I had explained it. But to illustrate it, what I meant, I said, for example, some people think that if you put an umbrella up indoors, that's bad luck. Yeah? I then took my umbrella from the pulpit, which I should have done because it's in the vestry there. <laughs> Don't want to hurt you. <laughs> and I opened my umbrella. And as I opened it, a church member was overheard to say, he's taken a chance. <laughs> I think the leak in the roof the following week was a pure coincidence. <laughs> The, the Christian way is not to live by luck or superstition or by Chinese um, fortune cookies or horoscopes. Some years ago, an entertainer and broadcaster friend of mine was interviewing an astrologer on local radio. The astrologer asked him what his star sign was. He said, oh, I don't have a star sign. She said, no, everybody's got a star sign. He said, no, 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 I don't have a star sign. Since I became a Christian, my destiny is in God's hands, not in astrological conjunctions. I mean, if there is such a thing as luck, it runs out. God's care and love for us never does. It was proved by the sacrificial death of Jesus on Calvary. As Christians, we are called to exercise our faith in the one who created us, the one who holds our destiny in his hands. So again, from Hebrews, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. Another way we could put it in the writer's terms, I suppose, is that faith is persistent hope, persistent hope in the promises of God. You got that? Persistent hope in the promises of God. Let's be honest, though. Our journey of faith has not been all sweetness and light. I think I speak for everyone here when I say that. Our journey of faith has been replete with bumps and potholes when most of us have been tested and sometimes to breaking point. A few weeks ago, the post-Easter Bible passage preached so elo eloquently by Robin, was about the road to Emmaus. Most of us have been on the road to Emmaus. Like Cleopas and his companion, the words that we have spoken on that road to Emmaus have often been words of pain, words of disappointment, of bewilderment and yearning. They are words we say when we have come to the end of our hopes, when our expectations have been dashed, when our cherished dreams are dead in the water, and there's nothing left but to feel de defeated and done. But some of the most memorable words in Luke's account, indeed, in Luke's gospel, 
are surely these four words. But we had hoped. But we had hoped. It's been well said that the world hopes for the best, but Jesus is the world's best hope. I truly believe that my life is fashioned not by luck, but is guided by the same God who put the stars and the sun in place. The very beginning of the universe, long before my ordination, long before I was capable of thinking of God and loving God, he had already thought of me. You see, though he is the Lord who stretches out his hand over the universe, he knows each one of us and he clasps us to his heart. And I know that he'll never give up on me. I shall always be his child, even when I wander away from him and when death comes or the world ends. His faithfulness will never cease. And what is true for me is true for each one of us, each one of us. Our faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. As a congregation, of which I've felt a great love over these years, but as a congregation, give thanks for the past. I know you do. Celebrate the present and look forward to the future. These are exciting days for you. If God is there for us at the beginning, he will also be there for us at the end. This, this, through faith, is the Christian hope. Amen. Thanks be to God. The choir will now sing the anthem.
Thank you, choir, and thank you, Derek. Let us pray. Living God, you have given us life and breath and all that we have. We have nothing to give you except that which we have received from you. So with these offerings given in this and other ways, help us to dedicate to you all that we have and all that we are, so that you may have what is indeed your own. In this Christian Aid Week, we give thanks for the committed work of staff and volunteers, seeking prayerful support in raising funds, organising sales, doing collections, and at the same time making decisions as how best to respond to the unending need across the world, whether working in the field alongside local groups, seeking to improve the lives of men, women, young people, girls and boys, relieving poverty and suffering, and all in fulfilment of the words of Jesus, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, you have done it to me. We ask a blessing on Val Brown, the new interim head of Christian Aid Scotland, as she takes over leadership during the temporary absence of Sally Foster Fulton during her time as moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland starting on Saturday. And we pray for the General Assembly for the moderator and each delegate as they debate and make decisions on behalf of the whole denomination. Guide them in their, deli in their deliberations that they might keep before them the primary calling of the church to know God and make him known through fellowship and service and worship. We give thanks for the Reverend Ian Greenshields, the outgoing moderator, for his encouragement on his visits to local churches and presbyteries, and particularly for his peace mission to South Sudan with the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then highlighting his moderatorial year by presenting King Charles with a copy of the King James authorised version of the Bible at the coronation. Bless the King and Queen and the Royal Household, whilst keeping before us always the plight of the underprivileged, the lonely, the despised and the suffering here in our parish and community, across Scotland and our United Kingdom. And so help us transform our prayers and our intentions into action on their behalf. For the sake of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, before the start of the service, I asked John if it would be appropriate to make a small presentation at this point in the service. I didn't tell him who to. John, would you like to join me? We couldn't possibly let a momentous occasion like this pass without a small presentation to oh, you. Graham. And John, with, from all your friends in St Paul's, many of whom go back to mission days with you in the summer, a small oh. presentation from us all and congratulations on your 50 years. Graham. <laughs> Can I just say, that's not all. 
because at the start of your sermon, you mentioned the party, the cake, and everything else. We have a cake in the large hall for you. My this goodness. is St Paul's. It's not a three-day feast as you've had in the past, but there is cake available. So please, if you have the time, come and join us in the hall for some cake. And there was a third element in the ordination, if I remember right. Excuse me a second. This is St Paul's. We have a bunch of flowers <laughs> for your dear wife, who I know is in the congregation. I'll not ask you to come forward and embarrass you. I think she should be embarrassed. I think she should be Jane, embarrassed. Jane, come and join us. Because she must have had a hand in this somewhere. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> Graham I, I, and, and members of the congregation, I really don't know what to say because, I mean, you, you would think that given, given how I started my sermon, that this was all organized, wouldn't you? And you, you're bound to say that John must have known. No idea. This has come as a very great surprise to me, but happening on this week when I will celebrate the 50th anniversary, then it's just so lovely to be here and to be sharing it with you. So thank you so much. I, I really am lost for words, <laughs> but I'm still going on and on. <laughs> and. Well, I hope many of you will come over to the hall and we'll have a little bit of cake. Graham, thank you so much and thank you, members of the congregation. God bless you. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Want to introduce oh, the last oh, time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the persons that I suppose has been part of that journey of faith in part of my ministry was Andrea Steele, who was organist at Cardross uh, Church. Andrea was also the head of music at Craig Home, where I was um, chaplain. And indeed, Andrea had the very, very sad task of playing at our late daughter's funeral. So Andrea has had a special place in our heart. The reason for mentioning this is that the hymn that we're going to finish with is Look Forward in Faith, written by the then minister Andrew Scobie of Cardross Church. And the music was composed by Andrea Steele. And the title, if you look it up in the hymnary, the title of the tune is Cardross. So it's lovely that Andrea has had that part in our life, as hundreds, maybe thousands of people have also. Let's conclude our service in the singing of Look Forward in Faith.
Now may the strength of God sustain you, the power of God preserve you, the hands of God protect you, the way of God direct you, the love of God go with you, and all those who are precious to you, now and forever. Amen.